Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Challenger Network News. And many have commented on the parallels between athletes and business professionals. And this isn't surprising. Passion, fixation on a goal, their characteristics are very easily aligned. So if these similarities are accepted, then can we apply the same lessons that we use in sports to business? Can leaders and managers of sports teams use the same expertise to lead other professionals? Or are there inherent differences that mean this is more marketing than reality? With that context, I'm super excited to welcome Fran Miller to the show today. And um, for those of you who don't know, Fran is currently the CEO of Bellstaff, one of the UK's most iconic luxury fashion brands. Prior to taking on this role, she was CEO of the Ineos Grenadiers cycling team and head of winning behaviours at Team Sky during a time of incredible sporting success. Um, and I'm Dan Garson, partner at Elixir, a very average sportsman, but a bit of a sports fanatic. I'm going to try not to name drop too much today, Fran, I promise. But I know you've worked with some serious sporting heroes, um, Chris Froome, Bradley Wiggins, Sir Dave Brailsford. Um, and I personally can't wait to hear a bit more about your story. Um, are you able to give us a couple of minutes just talking through your career and how you ended up at Bellstaff? Yeah, sure. Hi, Dan. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, so I actually um, left school at 18, didn't go to university, uh, was very dedicated to having a job better than my friends who had gone to university by the time they came out. Um, I came to work in London um, for a sporting event company run by a guy called Anthony Boucher. Um, and he had just bought the online rights to Wisdom, the Almanac. Um, and that's back in the late 90s when people couldn't understand why you'd ever want to put data on the internet. Um, and so I was working with him. My brother, um, who was a pro cyclist, did his first Tour de France and went into yellow on day one. Um, and my boss at the time said, why are you working in cricket? You should be working in cycling. Why don't you go and manage your brother? Um, and so that kind of kicked my career off in sort of athlete management. Um, I ended up setting up my own agency, representing David, and then going on to represent sort of 20 of the biggest uh, cyclists in certainly in the UK and some some Australians as well. Um, so I had Geraint Thomas, Mark Cavendish, Ian Sanard, David, Stuart O'Grady, Baden Cook. So a whole generation of young talent. Um, so that was between 2000 and 2007. And then 2007, Tour de France came to London. Um, there were five British riders in five different teams. I represented all of those riders and Brailsford was running the GB programme. And he approached me and said, would I be interested in helping set up a British team that the British fans could support? And obviously I was super motivated by that. So, you, said um, no, you said no, right? Yeah, exactly. I was like, ah, let me think about it. Um, and yeah, so I, I went basically just pre-Beijing, um, project managed the creation of um, what went on to become Team Sky. So I did all of the initial um, groundwork for the project. Dave went off to Beijing. They obviously were incredibly successful. Sky had already begun their relationship with us and then committed to the rest of the funding. And we launched the team in 2010. Um, and I basically worked in the senior management team all the way through, like I said, it sort of went from kind of operations to head of winning behavior to CEO. Um, yeah, seven Tour de France victories, two Giros, two Vuelters, um, and arguably the one of the most prolifically successful sports teams in the world. Um, we got acquired by Ineos in 2019 in March. Um, and so Jim Ratcliffe, he also bought Ben Ainsley's sailing team. And when we got acquired, he mentioned that he was also had contracted Elliot Kipchoge and the London Marathon to try and break the two hour marathon barrier with Elliot prior to the Tokyo Games. Um, and would we help on that project? And uh, obviously I was like, nope, it's a hard no. I'm too busy, I'm not doing it. Um, and Dave B dragged me into it and then Dave got sick. So I ended up running that project um, for the sort of four months from uh, May through to the actual event. We broke the two hour marathon barrier. And um, Jim, I sort of got, obviously through that got on Jim's radar and I realized I had become quite bored in cycling. The sort of challenge of doing 159 was so immense that I just loved being back doing something new and fresh and different and feeling challenged and invigorated. And I happened to mention in September last year that maybe the time had come for me to think about moving on. And um, five days later, I got a call saying I'd been made the CEO of Bellstaff. So it's been here a year now um, and it has been a pretty rapid learning curve, but yeah, I'm loving it so far. So that's the positive. <laughs> Thanks. I'm love to get into some of that as, as, as we go through it. From, 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 under, from mile running to, to bell star, um, yeah. definitely a bit of a difference. Yeah. And if we start a bit generally, um, when you hear people talk about lessons learned from managing sports teams and really, really successful sports mm. teams, um, what, what would you say are some of the biggest things that are transferable in a business context? Um, well, 
And listen, I, I didn't know until I, I came to Bellstaff what was genuinely going to be transferable. Uh, you know, I have worked in a very unique sports team. Um, for those of your sort of listeners who or people watching who know about the cycling success, you know, we had worked very closely with a forensic psychiatrist called Steve Peters from about 2004 as part of the Great Britain programme. And, and he played a fundamental part in the creation of Team Sky, but also in the philosophy and creation of the of all of the culture around around Team Sky. Um, and he has a very humanistic approach to, you know, if you want to get excellence in anybody, um, you have to focus on the on the human being um, and all of the kind of attributable parts to that human. And so rather than just think about the athlete, think about human human performance. Um, and so my belief had always been that if you took that methodology combined with the sort of marginal gains approach that Brailsford created, combined with a kind of laser like focus on the outcome, you know, all of those things that I, the component parts that I'd learned in, in the environment I'd been in, I was like, this has to be applicable elsewhere because it's not because we're doing it with athletes that's making us successful, it's because it's a process. So came into Bellstaff and thought, I'm just going to try to to really, and for, as, an, as a little bit of an experiment for myself, I was like, is, is it transferable? Can you do it? Um, and to be honest, the answer so far, touch wood, is yes. You know, we're, we're really seeing that that I'm really seeing that that methodology and that approach is is immensely transferable. So, you know, at, at its core, it's outcome focus. Be really clear on what it is you're trying to achieve and how you're going to achieve it. Once you've got outcome focus, establish exactly how you're going to measure success along the way and what are the incremental steps that will, you know, will ensure that you get there. Make sure you've got, we call them podium people in cycling. Make sure you've got podium people around you and you know, you know, they know what they're trying to deliver. Create a culture and environment where people have ownership and can and can genuinely thrive and, and get the best out of themselves in a, in a psychologically secure space. And then, you know, once you've got all of that, what I would consider to be the basics, then you layer on the marginal gain. So how do you how do you go for that? You know, constantly getting the incremental incremental gain and constantly trying to push to get better. And that's basically what I've been doing for a year here. So so far, so good. <laughs> and and talking of marginal gains. Um, where did that come from and, and 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 how did you see it evolve over time? I mean, so Dave B, um, I've obviously worked with Dave B for nearly 20 years um, and he came into British cycling in uh, early 2000 um, and took over after the Sydney Olympic Games. Um, and he was, he's actually, does, has done an MBA. He um, is, you know, sort of almost a trained accountant. He knows a lot about accounting practices. He knows a huge amount about business methodology. And he, his view of it was like, it's, comes from an accounting methodology, basically, which was if you were to break it down and look at all of the incremental areas where you could potentially get gain and then add them all back together, you, you'd move yourself forward. It, it also comes from the concept, particularly in road cycling, where we knew there was an endemic problem with doping and we weren't going to dope. Um, and similarly in track cycling, you know, Dave never wanted to be, there's no point, human performance isn't fun if you're cheating. So um, we sort of felt there was a 10 to 15% gain being made by the guys who were, who were cheating. So you can't find 10 to 15% in one thing. So if you then have to, if you break down the performance to everything from shoes to bike, to helmet, to skin suit, to nutrition, to body composition, to you know every single component part, and you try and find half a percent, a percent in all of them and aggregate them back together, you will be better once you've done that aggregation back together. And, and Dave was just, relentless with it you know it's it's an entire it's not just a it's not just something that he spouts out every now and then it's it's in it's baked into every single element of what he does and how he operates and he trains those of us around him and who've grown up around him in that thing you're like indoctrinated with it it's, it's always about how can you be one percent better where can we find the one percent you know what and it's he talks so if anyone's heard him talking it's like he talks about the steak and the peas and it's like you, you can't take your eyes off the steak you know which is you've got to have a fit athlete you know, they've got to be good enough, first and foremost. Doesn't matter how many marginal gains you give a donkey, they're not going to win a bike race. So it's like, you've got to have a really great athlete. But if you've got a great athlete and they're trained brilliantly and they're in, and they're in the peak condition on the right equipment, then you start to layer on those marginal gains. That That's when you start to see that really, you know, discretionary performance. That's what he calls it. You know, the kind of the difference between the good and the great. Um, and yes, he's, he just absolutely does that in every element of what we do as a business. And I, and I just, trans I learned it. I believe in it. I believe in it passionately, and I and I transferred it in in here. And I think my 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 job was always to make people in the business understand marginal gains, but also understand that it's not just about equipment. It's also about how can I be one percent better? If I you know could I handle myself better? Could I learn a bit more about myself? Could I deal with a phone call better? Could I treat my team a little bit better? It's 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 every element of what you do, looking to be a little bit better all the time. 
and, and I've heard you talk to your team a lot about accountability and yeah. personal ownership. Yeah. Have you noticed that there's a bit of a different culture in a business climate in that respect to how there is in sports teams? Yeah, I mean, it, night and day, that, that's been the biggest th- realisation, actually, because what you don't realise, particularly, it's not like I was working for Scunthorpe Albion, do you know what I mean? I was working for the greatest, one of the greatest cycling teams the world's ever seen. No offence to Scunthorpe Albion. No, 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 no. I don't know about the team, but if you <laughs> <laughs> But it's, you know, I think when you're working at the very, very, very top of a sport, by definition, the people that you're working with have, have got to the top of their game. You know that you're working with the very best in the world and even even the young talent that you're bringing in they're the best they were the best junior in their region or they were the best you know they, they've been the best pro in their area the best mechanic the best carer you know that's that's what's brought them and enabled them to get to where they are so they already know a lot about high performance about self-awareness about management of you know a team environment they're, they're aware of a lot of that stuff and they it might be subliminal they might not have had it called to the forefront of what they do but they, they get it and, and you're not having to push as hard so you're not having to educate in the first instance as much you're not having to push as hard and also if you're in professional sport you're there because you want to win and you want to be the best and some people come to a job because they want to feed their kids and they want to have a nice house and they want to you know go home in the evenings at a normal time and have a weekend and that's totally fine <laughs> but you don't get that in sport so in sport you can push people really hard and you can go after it and everyone's kind of in that frame of mind and that that's not what that's not how it is or how it should be in a business environment do, do you find it challenging as a, a leader with those traits to try and adapt and, and get a, and get that message across to people who are of that mindset I find it challenging in a nice way. Like I find it, I think, because I I believe in, a, in having a values-led business, you know, I, th- I think that's really important. And I think you should always come from a human and a, and a people place first, because I think that's where you get true excellence. But it's it's very hard in a sports environment to be saying to people, I, we really care about you and we want you to be okay and we care about your well-being, but can you do a 240 days on the road, please? And can you stay away from your kids? And can you, do you know what I mean? Like the, the requirement that we, the, the standard that we set in the cycling team and the requirement that we had got to by the time we were at the very, very top, there's only a certain type of person in the world who can do that. And there is a natural conflict between you know, being the very, very best and having a work-life balance or having any of that, you know, and you, you end up with quite extreme people living quite extreme lives. And actually here, I'm able to live a mu- much more true to my own values, which is your work is is an amazing and important part of your life, but it is not your entire existence and identity. And I quite like being able to run an organization where it's like, I, I want people to have a motivating, joyful experience at work and be pushing themselves and want to be the best but I also want them to have a life and to have well-being <laughs> you know and that's that's been a really nice challenge for me because it's quite new to me to be able to do that and and just a reminder to anyone watching if you do have questions for Fran please do put them in the chat and we'll try and get through them and at Elixir we talk a lot about being uncomfortable in an uncomfortable environment and and, and recognizing that the best teams that you talk of aren't always the easiest places to operate in and um, what are your reflections on that? Is that is that something you, you agree with? Yeah, I mean, 100%. It's, um, I remember one of the constant arguments between Brailsford and, and Steve, and I, and I don't think either of them might, would mind me saying this, is that Steve really wanted people to be happy and Dave really wanted people to win. And and those two things constantly bounce off each other. Do you know what I mean? And, and actually what they did, the alchemy of the two of those as leaders within an organisation meant that you there was never a true tipping point right it was like you'd, you'd, ju- you'd edge towards a bit too happy and it would edge back towards performance and it would edge. so I totally relate to it I remember when I before I made the move from my agency to working with Brailsford full-time I went and saw Chris Boardman and um, who won the Olympic gold medal in Barcelona arguably one of the sort of founding fathers of the of the Olympic success uh, within the UK and a, a real tech genius um, and I, you know, he's a he's a lovely guy as well. And I, I went and spoke to him and said, "What do you think about me doing this role? And it's going to be full time, and I'm going to be project managing everything across the programs." And he was like, "Listen, it's it's an incredible opportunity, but you've got to be really aware of the fact that it's going to be hard." And I was like, "Yeah, I know it's going to be hard." And he's like, "No, no, you, you won't have experienced this yet." But he's like, "If if you want to be the very best in the world, you're going to be push. You're pushing so hard all the time that you're constantly on the edge." 
And he was like, and not a lot of people can do that. And he said, and you've got to get very quickly, get comfortable with being uncomfortable and get very quickly, get comfortable with being on the edge all the time. Like you're just going to push over. He said, because the minute you don't feel like that, you're not pushing hard enough and you won't win. And I, and that stuck with me. And that, that's more the challenge here is that I, I can push hard and I can go at it and I've got a big engine and I'm like, I mean, you've probably seen it. I'm like, let's go again, let's go again. And I have to rein myself in a little bit because I'm so comfortable being uncomfortable that my my threshold for change, my threshold for um, instability, my threshold for challenge is very, very high. And so I forget that people are around me aren't don't have that and are like oh my god what are you doing you're mad so I have to constantly kind of check myself to be like okay other people aren't as comfortable as me with this because I'm my threshold is way higher because of 20 years in in performance sport and are you seeing your leadership style evolve subtly because of that over the last few months yeah I mean I think definitely being trying it's the constant balance. It's, it's trying to be the Steve and the Dave for myself all the time. You know, it's trying to it's trying to constantly think about that. And and also the other thing I've really loved about being here and and the sort of challenge to myself as a leader is how do you work with a younger cohort? You know, how do you work with a more female? Co- you know, there's I've never ever worked in an organisation with more than like three other women, and the other two I've hired. Do you know what I mean? So it's like I, I've never been somewhere where it's nearly fifty fifty. You know, and actually maybe maybe seventy thirty here. Um, so that's been a real interesting challenge as well, because it's an environment that's mu- much more empathetic, much more considered, m- sometimes much more emotional. <laughs> I've had a lot more tears here than I ever got at the cycling team. But I've really enjoyed that, you know, and I've enjoyed having to balance that and, and figure that out for myself. And, and what would success, you talk about having a world, world class cycling team and, and all the wins that you listed. What, what would you consider to be similar success? Bellstaff. Um, I would like Bellstaff to be f- to to become renowned for being one of the greatest places to work in in Europe. You know, I want it to be a place that people think what well, does excellence look like? I could go and work in sport. If I'm going to work in a different industry, I'd like to work at Bellstaff because they're they're famous for being world class, profitable. You achieve your goals. You you know you go there and it's like a fast track for your career. I'd love it. I'd love that. I'd love that that our reputation became that as a brand we were, we were a supercharger of people and that we, you know, not only are we profitable, not only are we in hugely successful and a global brand from, from our core competency perspective, but that for our people, this is somewhere that you come if you want to be the best in the world or what you do. Pretty inspiring in a retail context as well. Yeah. There's definitely a, there's definitely something in that. Yeah. And um, one, one other topic I was, I was really interested to, to kind of hear about is um, when you go back to being, in the cycling team and being in that environment. Um, when you say people did whatever it took to win, how how would you see that translating into business? Because sometimes we can't do whatever it takes to win um, because it's not quite as in control as we are yeah. in a sports environment. Yeah. Um, how can you how, how how would you see that translating? Well, I think I mean I think also that you we you can't do whatever it takes to win in sport either but unless you want to cheat. Do you know what I mean? So I think that there is that bit too, which is you, you do whatever it takes to win, but you have to constantly create the cultural environment where you win in the right way. Um, so I think that, you know, from my perspective, it's defining what does win mean? Because the, the other thing about a cycling team is, you know, only one guy stands on the podium. It's not like when a football team wins a match and everyone celebrate, all 11 guys celebrate. In our sport, eight guys go to the Tour de France, they thrash themselves for three weeks and one guy walks away a millionaire, you know, walks away with the yellow jersey, walks away, the, the team don't, the team weren't sat on the bus on the Champs-Élysées drinking beer, while the guy they've been riding for for the last three weeks is like, you know, being lauded as a hero. So what winning means for those athletes sat on the bus is very different to what winning means to a Bradley Wiggins or a Chris Froome or a Garrett Thomas or an Egan Bernal, and making sure that you've identified what that is. You know, so for a Luke Rowe, for example, his idea of winning is being a road captain in a Tour de France winning team. It's not winning the tour, you know, and he has his own ambitions elsewhere in the season, like winning Paris Roubaix, for example. And the team has to pivot and support that, you know, as much as it pivots to support him to be the team leader. So I always think that winning can't be singular. Winning has to be a that everyone has a different definition of what winning means for them. You know, some people, some people winning is getting home to give their kids dinner. You know, that's winning. It's like, right, I'm going to I'm going to lead a life that enables me to get home to feed my kids and, you know, to have a weekend. That, that's cool. You just got to understand that. And if you can 
you know, this holy grail of managing a brilliant team is knowing what individual winning looks like for each person in that organization. And I think the same applies in business. It's like, what does winning really look like for your people? And what does winning really look like for this business? You know, right now, we, we can't be profitable this year. We can't win in that sense, but we can get a little bit out of debt. We can get our systems a bit better. We can get our processes right. We can get the right people in place. That's that's winning too. So it's identifying and being really clear about the wins. And um, Fran, I think we could talk about this for ages, but that's been an incredibly inspiring conversation. Thank you so much for Very your welcome. time today. Um, and uh, everyone else, look forward to tuning in soon for the next edition of Challenger Network News. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Fran. <laughs>